Hello and welcome to Crime Watch Daily Updates. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Years ago, I traveled to Hartford, Wisconsin to look into the death of a talented musician and aspiring actress named Jessie Blodgett. She had a knack for writing songs and playing instruments, but one of her close friends ended her potential before she truly had a chance to let it shine. 19-year-old Jessie was found dead on July 15th of 2013, just one day after she and her theater friend celebrated a run of Fiddler on the Roof where Jessie played the Fiddler. She had strangulation marks on her neck and what looked like ligature marks on her wrists. Just three days before she was found dead, police in a nearby town were investigating an attack after a woman said that she had been attacked from behind by a man holding a knife. Detectives soon honed in on one suspect, Daniel Bartlett. Well, Daniel and Jesse dated briefly in high school and the two remained close friends. In fact, Jesse's parents were shocked that it could be Daniel because Daniel spent so much time at their home. How could he do such a thing? He was arrested and charged with her murder on July 31st of 2013, as well as three other charges related to the attack. He was convicted in August of 2014 and two months later sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Daniel's attorneys appealed his conviction to the Wisconsin Court of Appeals, but the court rejected his argument. He then took the case to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and in February of 2018, the high court affirmed his conviction. Let's take a look back at the case that silenced a young voice and her talent way too soon. There is a killer in this cast, and someone on this stage is about to die. Oh, my God. Hartford 901, what's your emergency? It looks like strangulation mark. An imposter on the prowl. He is able to present himself to the world in a very different light than the way he actually is. Acting on evil. He staged her body. A real-life thriller as twisted as any drama. You've got one woman who's been attacked and another woman who's dead. A lot of dark, dark stuff. And when the plot finally unravels. Right when I saw his face, I'm like, yeah. The suspect at the center. We told him, you had the rock guy. Will leave a community stunned and several families torn apart. No remorse, no compassion. No, honey, no. I've interviewed killers before. He's at a different level. This was Jessie Blodgett, the essence of who she was and on most days, how you'd find her. Every time I would go over to her house, she'd be playing the piano. Even when I was trying to talk to her, she'd be playing the piano and I'd be like, I'm trying to talk to you. You know, she was always singing, always dancing. And as both a public performer and a music tutor for local kids, Jessie was something of a star in the small town of Hartford, Wisconsin. What was she like as a little girl? She was brilliant. In first grade, the teacher created her own curriculum for Jessie, and when the class's spelling words were and and the, Jessie's first one was metamorphosis, an anesthesiologist. <laughs> A brilliant mind that Jesse would use to pursue many passions as she grew, from fighting for animal rights to advocating against violence towards women. But in the end, it always came back to music. We actually wrote some songs together. She was just brilliant at writing music. But Jessie wasn't the only exceptional talent to come out of Hartford. Enter her good friend and classmate, Dan Bartelt. Dan and Jess sat next to each other every day in school, all through high school. Dan was a gifted violinist. He was first chair and Jess was second chair. Dan was hilarious. You know, I always thought he was the funny, really outgoing, always making jokes. He was also very smart. I kind of admired their friendship. Jesse and Dan also had a shared love for the stage, and on paper, they had all the makings of an arts-loving power couple, but they tried that. Didn't work. They dated for about three or four months, freshman year of high school. Um, they broke up. 
but Dan is the one who broke it off. Why? I don't know. We thought that he's a freshman in high school. He doesn't need to explain himself why he's not committed for life here. And anyway, they were better as friends. After high school, Jesse and Dan went away to different colleges, but they reconnected the following summer. Jess came home one day and said, Dad, Mom, Dan's back. He dropped out of college. He's a straight-A student. What's up with that? I know that they became really close when he had dropped out of college. They would play music together all the time. They were collaborating. The two even wrote and recorded this song together, which now serves as something of a time capsule. Just a few weeks after posting that tune on YouTube, Jesse and Dan would be in the spotlight for separate but equal reasons. Dan landed a starring role in Bye Bye Birdie. And Jesse? Jesse was the fiddler in Fiddler on the Roof. Here she is playing for a packed house on opening weekend. These last few notes, Jesse's swan song. That was her last night on earth. Just hours after curtain call, Jessie is seen here at the cast party, her smile apparently betraying some very uneasy feelings. Issues that had to do with at least two older men in attendance. Later that night, technically early the next morning, July 15th, Jessie returns home and runs into her mom. The two talk about that party. They talk about two of the people at the cast party were um, kind of uh, flirting with her. She even put those feelings down in her diary that same night, writing in part, I think I'm being corrupted. I think certain men are taking what should be platonic love and perverting it into a competition. But Jesse also goes on to write, I am not helpless. I will recognize problems and confront them without fear. God be with me. And then she went to bed? Yes. Around 8 the next morning, Jesse's mom, Joy, dropped some laundry off in Jesse's room before heading to work. Jesse's dad had already left for the day. Jesse was asleep in her bed and everything was fine. Four hours after that, Jesse's mom returned home for her lunch break. The house was quiet. Joy just thought she was sleeping in. She was a teenager on break. But when she went to wake her daughter, she was mad that Jess wasn't answering her. She uh, went into Jesse's room. She couldn't understand why she wasn't responding. And then she touched her, and Jesse was cold. Oh my God. Oh my God. Hartford 901, what's your emergency? <laughs> my daughter is blue. I went to wake her up. And I just got home from, for lunch, and she won't wake up. She's oh 19. my God. Okay. okay, hang on just a second. Okay. Trish. Okay, so she, is she breathing? I don't think so, no. Jesse is unresponsive, covered up in her own bed. Okay, ma'am, do you know how to do CPR? <laughs> Jesse. You do, do you know how to do CPR, ma'am? She's cold. She's cold. She's cold. She's cold. You can hear the anguish in her voice as she tries to process the scene and especially what she sees next. Oh my gosh, she's going to... Okay. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. She rolled her over and she saw ligature marks. Her pants are all wet and she's got, it looks like strangulation marks. There are strangulation marks? That's what it looks like. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. After that, the dispatcher puts Joy on hold while she alerts EMS. Sadly, it's already too late. Honey, what happened to you? Oh, no. No. Honey, no. No. <laughs> That's how we found her, dead. She was just 19 years old. Buck 
Blodgett was at work the Monday his wife found their only child, Jesse, apparently strangled to death in her bedroom. She just seems so good. <laughs> She's so good. By the time Buck returned home, investigators already had his daughter cordoned off. Did you know that she's been murdered in her own bed? They wouldn't let me upstairs, so I couldn't see her. I couldn't touch her. I couldn't say goodbye. I couldn't tell her I loved her. And I couldn't tell her I was sorry for not being there when she needed her dad. And um, I, I'm sorry, I forgot the question. Detective Richard Thickens of the Hartford PD was one of the first investigators on the scene that day. What did you find? We found uh, Jessie on the floor, very obvious mark on her neck, and marks on her wrist, very faint marks that could possibly have been binding marks. At that point, I believe we had a homicide on her hands. Jessie's mom also tells detectives that when she found her daughter, her hair and clothes were wet. A sign the killer may have spent extra time with his victim. He staged her body. I believed he washed her body and then placed it back in the bed, covered her up. Did you think it was someone who knew the victim, or did you think that this was a random act of violence? There was no signs of forced entry, so it led us to believe that it was somebody that knew the house. But who knew Jessie's movements so intimately, and who would use that knowledge to end her life? Police didn't have to look far to find their first suspects. Jessie had been in a play that had wrapped up a Sunday night, and afterwards she had gone to a cast party, and Jessie had talked about some concerns she had about other people involved in the cast. Concerns she wrote about in her journal on the day she died. Her own diary is telling you that there is an older man who's been bothering her and you start looking at him. Absolutely. What did you find? We found that there were some concerns with his actions at the cast party. He had actually pulled her onto his lap, according to one of her friends. And on the day Jess was killed? He hadn't shown up for work on Monday, which for us was a significant concern. But police say he cooperated with the investigation, and after talking to the man for a few hours, we cleared him pretty quickly. Detectives also cleared the other man Jesse wrote about in her diary. What are you narrowing down on? To someone that knew her activity and knew where she'd be. What cops in Hartford didn't realize was that authorities in the neighboring town of Richfield were already zeroing in on the suspect, but for an entirely different reason, an entirely different attack on an entirely different victim. And how was he holding it? It happened three days before Jesse's murder. A young woman named Melissa Etzler was walking her dog at a local park when she was tackled from behind by a man with a knife. Washington County Detective Joel Clausing interviewed Melissa in the hospital shortly after the assault. Her emotions still raw as her wounds from fighting off the attacker. All right. This is Detective Clausing. It is July 12th. Sorry. Do you need me to stop? And so what was her story? Well, I got down to the hospital, and I started talking to her, and she couldn't write because her hand was all cut up. So I got a recorded statement. Melissa tells Detective Clausing she was just getting ready to leave the park that morning when she's startled by the sound of footsteps behind her. So I looked back and I laughed and said, oh, you scared me, just because I thought he was some friendly guy. And then I turn around again because I can hear him coming at me and I see a knife in his hand. Melissa continues her story a few days later when police take her back to that park to reenact the crime. This is how far away you were when you first saw it. Okay? Then you turn around. Then After that, Melissa says it was fight back or die. said something weird to her. After she disarmed him, he asked if he could leave. <laughs> and, and, I, and I believe she said no. 
you try taking it from me, I said no. It's like, you're gonna go, I'm taking this with me. And as Melissa tells us, that's exactly what she did. Oh, I, I, I kept the knife, yeah. Okay. That was in my car. It oh. was a fish fillet knife. Wow, so yeah. you kept the knife, right. Is that when he said, can I go? He can't get it from me. He, he's trying, but he just can't get it out of my grip. So he finally is just like, can I just go? And it's like, well, you're the one on top of me, so. You're the one who attacked me, right. what are you doing? <laughs> exactly. So it was just, it was just bizarre. She says after that, the suspect ran off, but that she remembered every detail of her perpetrator. I can still see it in my head right now, what he was wearing. A white male, 18 to 20 years of age, 6'2", 210 pounds. Yep. He had light blonde hair with very fair skin. Yes. Okay, and you said he had checkered shorts? Mm-hmm, plaid shorts. Melissa was the best witness I've ever had in my entire career. She described where he was parked in the parking lot and what kind of vehicle he was driving to within a couple of years. Dark blue minivan, Dodge Caravan. I don't know what year. An older model, though. Based on Melissa's description of the suspect, police released this composite sketch to the media. We expected a bunch of calls saying, I knew who this guy was. We didn't get anything. But when they circulate Melissa's near-perfect description of the suspect's van... I was approached by a deputy Meyer from our department. He came up to me and said, I saw a car like that parked in that very same spot a couple months ago. But even better, he said, I found you a plate. How did he have the plate? He ran it that day. No way. Yeah. He ran the plate that day. He knew he ran the plate that day. So he looked back on all the plates that he had run over the past how many ever weeks and found it. And when police put a name to that plate, the focus of two mysteries in two separate towns narrows in on one very surprising suspect. The owner didn't match the description, but then they found out that they had a son who did. On the same day, 19-year-old actress slash activist slash singer-songwriter Jessie Blodgett was being murdered in her own bed. 12 miles away in the neighboring town of Richfield, Wisconsin, a woman named Melissa Etzler was walking detectives through an assault that happened to her three days before. The police were still trying to find the person who attacked you. Right. Did you ever get a really good look at him? I know I got a good um, look at his clothes and his van. And because of that, Detective Joel Clausing of the Washington County Sheriff's Office was able to track down a license plate for the suspect's vehicle. Though to his initial dismay, it came back registered to a middle-aged couple. We're looking for a 20-year-old kid that's six foot one, 200 pounds. We're not looking for a 45-year-old man and his wife. But when police question that man and his wife, they find out the couple has a son, 20 years old, roughly six foot one, 200 pounds. Mom and dad gave us his cell phone number. As we're driving away from the residence, I called them. Around that same time, in the town of Hartford, Jesse Blodgett's loved ones have filled her family's home. We all sat in a circle around our living room and people shared memories and cried together and hugged. Among those mourners, Jesse's old artistic collaborator, fellow actor slash singer-songwriter, Daniel Bartelt. Dan actually did most of the talking. He was talking, 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 talking. He did a lot of talking. And he was about to do a lot more. Then all of a sudden he was, he had this phone call and I just kind of looked at him when he got this phone call and he wasn't like upset, he wasn't surprised. Uh, and he just said, oh, okay, I'll be right over there. And then he hung up the phone. On the other end of that phone, detective clausing. Daniel Bartelt was the son of that couple, the driver of the van. I told him we needed to talk to him. And he said, okay. And I asked him where he was. He said he was at Jesse Blodgett's vigil. And by this time, even though it wasn't your case, you knew who Jesse Blodgett was. Yes, but what sparked more interest, when I got off the phone, I looked at Detective Walsh and said he never even asked me what this was about. Uh, how many people get called by a detective, asked to meet, and they don't say, what's going on? Why do I need to meet you? He never said it. And 
apparently he didn't have much to say to his friends back at the Blodgett house either. We kind of looked at everyone and was like, I got called down to the police station. Of course, at that point, no one there even knew about the attack on Melissa. He's in our house and Joy, this is my wife. She said, Dan, don't worry. They're gonna talk to all of Jesse's friends. And um, little did we know at the time why they were talking to Dan. All right, do you know what this is about? No. This is about an incident that uh, Detective Walsh and our investigator had the last Friday. Okay. You're questioning him only about the attack in the park, not Jesse's murder. That's correct. I tell him, you know, I just want to talk to you about some stuff. And I said, where, uh, where were you at again? I was uh, uh, in uh, Hartford, Jesse Walsh's house. That the girl that just passed? Yeah, we were visiting her ex. And I said, you know, just making small talk, what, whatever happened with her? And he said, That was in the first two minutes of the interview, but would prove to be one of its most significant moments. More on why in a moment. But first, I wanted to talk to him about my case, right? So we started asking him about his history. Okay. okay. Were you at a party last night? No. Any? Well, I don't think we showed up. Dan denies knowing anything about the assault on Melissa, but then something catches Clausing's eye. What have you on? Where? On your elbow. Well, probably. See your hands? The this. Cut the stab with a screw at work. He had an injury to his thumb, a puncture cut. We asked him where he had sustained that injury, and he said he did it at work. Try to my thumb. And then um, Detective Walsh says, If we check with your employer, would, they, would you still have your job? No. Okay, that's what I thought. Did he really have a job? No. Every day he would get up, put on his work clothes, grab his lunch, get in his van, and pretend to go to work to his parents. But if Dan wasn't working, then his explanation for that cut wasn't either. Then I said, well, how'd you injure your thumb then? Tell us about that. I was cooking a cup of beer on my and that's when I just I stopped him and I said, Let's talk. Okay. Nobody in their right mind would lie about cutting themselves if it happened at home cooking. Okay? Where did what happened? Just be honest. And to closing surprise, he suddenly was. I've gone to the park before. Eventually he admitted that he was the one that attacked Melissa in the park. You went after that girl, right? Yes. Okay. Why? What were you going to do? I was scared so much. Dan tells detectives that since he dropped out of college, he's felt frightened of life, and he just wanted someone else to feel the same. A confession complete with motive, but then investigators didn't necessarily need it. At the park, they find Dan's blood on multiple items and a roll of heating duct tape that matches tape in Dan's house. Plus, they had their star witness. They had me do a lineup. Um, right when I saw his face, I'm like, yeah, that's him, 100%. So you had your guy. For the attack. And then what happens? Well, we gotta arrest him, you know, but now we discussed, you know, do you think he's the guy? The Jesse Blodgett guy. Correct, it, you know, do you think he's good for the murder? And the reason they wonder that goes back to those first few minutes of the interview when Daniel Bartelt said this. Raped and he said, well, that she was raped and murdered, which was significant. Because? Because the police, us, at that time, didn't even know that she was sexually assaulted. Investigators expected to find the man guilty of the brazen assault on Melissa Etzler lurking in the shadows. They figured any persons of interest in 19-year-old Jesse Blodgett's murder 12 miles away to be hiding underground. Instead, Daniel Bartelt was basking in the spotlight, even landing the lead role in Bye Bye Birdie just before both attacks. Dan was one of the most intelligent people that I've ever interviewed. He had a sense about him that was bad. Dan made your skin crawl. Uh, yes. Especially when just one day after Jesse's murder, before the forensics had even come back, this trained actor flubbed one of his lines. He said that he believed that Jesse had been raped and murdered. And you didn't even know she had been raped yet. 
We had no indications of her being raped. Only the killer could know that. So while Dan sits in jail for that assault on the girl in the park, detectives covering that case share what they know with detectives investigating Jesse's murder. I was doing search warrants on Dan's computer, and in the computer there was a lot of bondage pornography. There was a lot of, I don't know how you describe it, it's dark, dark stuff including one Wikipedia search on spree killers and several other searches for serial killers. It didn't end there. We actually had searches for uh, pornographic snuff films that actually seemed to match the series of events that occurred in Jesse's room. In the movie, after strangling her, he washes her. One of the things that Mrs. Blodgett had made note of was how Jesse was placed back in her bed, covered up, and that her hair was wet. Just an eerie coincidence, detectives were about to ask the suspect themselves. And what I want to talk to you about, um, Jesse Blodgett, and to understand that you, you are friends with her, okay? This time, Dan is a little more careful not to incriminate himself. What do you think happened to Jesse? I have no idea. Dan admits that he'd reconnected with his one-time girlfriend that summer and had been at Jesse's house a lot in the weeks before her murder. He even says he had good reason to hide that fact, but it wasn't because of anything nefarious. Started kissing on the couch and she asked if I wanted to go up with her. He said that they had a uh, romantic relationship, but he hadn't made it public because he was dating someone else. But detectives are suspicious. The entire time I talked to him, he made it look like he was crying, but I didn't see him shed a tear. It's one of those kind of cries. Right. A lot of noise and no tears. Right. As for Dan's whereabouts on the day of Jesse's murder, he says he was driving around in his parents' van, pretending to be at work. He said that he had left the house and he had gone to a couple of different parks, ending up at Woodlawn Park in the city. What's that you end up there? I'm 10 or so. Where you go about Woodlawn? You keep reading, trying to write. An airtight alibi claims Dan. But then, get this, when it comes to what Dan was, quote, trying to write, he tells detectives it's a series of stories about a young girl, not unlike Jesse, who would eventually be murdered. The main character's name is Jessica. So he admits to killing off the fictional character Jessica, not so much for Jesse Blodgett. Can you help us out on it? Give us, give us some closure. He denied any involvement. And as detectives continue to press, Dan's tone gets suddenly less teary. I can be very uncomfortable. Why is that? Because of what you're trying to send you in. And what's that? Dan uses his right to remain silent on that question, and he won't have much to say beyond that either. Let's see how this is helpful. If we're going to talk more, I might have a word. And with that statement, it was interview over. Dan had confessed to nothing. As for his alibi... Dan said that he was at the Woodlawn Park. So they get video, sure enough, there's Dan. He was there that morning that Jesse was killed. That's him in the red shorts, definitely not at the scene of the crime. So then, had police been too quick to pin a murder on an easy suspect? One who had already confessed to another crime? Jesse's own parents thought so. Especially because Daniel Bartelt spent hours grieving with them after Jesse's murder. In fact, when the police called Dan... Dan was at our house. Was crying over Jesse? Yeah, and sharing memories with us. I hugged Dan several times. We were telling the police it wasn't him and he was a good guy. But Jesse's parents are wrong, fooled by his act. As it turns out, Dan's own alibi would also be his undoing. Back at that park, police uncover the dark side of Daniel Bartelt. They go take all the trash out of the trash bins at Woodlawn Park they find the cereal box. Inside the cereal box is ball gag, 
ligatures, alcohol wipes. And the rope found in the trash lines up perfectly with the ligature marks on Jesse's neck. Then when detectives search Dan's house, they find the exact same rope in his garage. Plus, remember that tape investigators found on Dan's vents that matched tape he dropped during Melissa's assault? Incredibly, a full week after Jesse Blodgett's murder, investigators taking a second look at the scene find the exact same tape under her bed. His fingerprints were on that. Pretty incredible. Yes. And based on the evidence, investigators believe they know exactly why the tape was there. What did he use this tape for? He hogtied Jess. He gagballed her and he taped her so the gag ball wouldn't come out. Detectives also find both Jesse and Dan's DNA on those ligatures and Dan's DNA under Jesse's fingernails. And when it comes to that detail Dan let slip in his first interview. And did he rape her? We found DNA that indicated that he assaulted her. After that, it was hard for anyone to deny the Daniel Bartelt they thought they knew was something else entirely. Dan's a chameleon. Um, he is able to present himself to the world in a very different light than the way he actually is. Good qualities for an actor, lethal for a killer. You want to believe the best about people. You want to believe the best about people that you call your friends. It's to you know, see your friends not be evil. Even without a confession, Dan Bartelt is charged with first degree intentional homicide of his old friend, Jesse. But there's still one giant question left hanging. Why? Dan would get one more chance to say his piece in court, but would he finally come clean? Or would it be the ultimate slap in the face to a family already in mourning? Mr. Bartell, before I sentence you, anything you want to say on your behalf? I do. Jesse Blodgett didn't have an arch nemesis. She wasn't murdered by an angry foe. Jesse's life was taken by someone she thought was a friend. She definitely admired Dan, you know, his musical talents, his, you know, his mind, his intelligence. She really did have a good friendship with Dan. The two even wrote and recorded songs together just weeks before Daniel Bartelt bound Jesse as she slept, sexually assaulted her, then strangled her to death, leaving her dead in her bed for her mother to find. Honey, what happened to you? <laughs> but the big question still remaining was why he did it. Personally, don't like labels, but I think he's a sociopath. I think he has no empathy. I think he's brilliant and talented, like many sociopaths, and they're calculating, they learn how to fit in and blend. And based on the evidence, which included a lot of disturbing searches found on Dan's computer, the prevailing theory is that the big reason Dan killed Jesse was just to satisfy a sick urge. I think she was a convenient target. He knew where she was going to be. He knew there wasn't going to be a family in the house. I think he wanted to kill someone and she was available. And if cops hadn't caught Dan when they did, you think he was gonna kill again? I believe there's a possibility that he would have tried it again. What's the time span between the attack in the park and the killing of Jesse? Three days. At trial, prosecutors bring up all these points and more. Daniel Bartelt is found guilty. I think Dan's a bad, bad person. He's where he should be. But that's what everyone else says about him. Now that he's been found guilty, what would Dan have to say for himself? Would he finally confess? Buck, Joy, I can't give you the answers that you're looking for. Guess not. When he started by saying Buck and Joy, I wish I could give you the answers you're looking for. We knew it wasn't going to go in a, a good direction. This jumpsuit that I'm wearing, these shackles that I'm put in, don't make me guilty. No, it was the mountain of evidence that made him guilty. And yet, like an actor delivering his final monologue in a play, Dan prattles on. I can't prove that I'm innocent. 
to anyone, not even myself. I can't prove that a sun that I haven't seen for over 400 days still even rises and sets, but I like to believe that it does. The only reason, the only reason that I went to trial at all is because I was told I would not be allowed to acknowledge that I couldn't refute the evidence and just accept sentencing without saying that I'd done something I hadn't. Basically said, there is this evidence, but no, I didn't kill her? He said some weird things. Weird things like this. I'm suffering now more than I ever have before. And this. Judge Martins, I, uh, I pity you. But in the end, the one thing Dan didn't say. My conscience is clear. <laughs> well, he didn't acknowledge what he did, and let alone apologize to Joy, and to me, and to Jesse, and to everybody. He continued to deny what he did. Daniel Bartelt is sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. Anger, hatred, rage. Any normal parent of a murdered child might be feeling all of these things. But when it was Jesse's father's turn to speak in court, he turned to his daughter's killer and said this. I forgive you, as I have every single day since we found out it was you. I believe there's good and bad in every one of us, so I don't demonize or vilify you. You showed a lot of grace and kindness and love in your statement. I don't want you to think that I'm living in some sugar-coated bubble and I don't have pain or anger at all. At the same time, stronger than that was this inexplainable peace and forgiveness and a sense that everything is okay. And I don't know how to explain that to this day. Because he's seen the impact his forgiveness has had on others, he's decided to honor his daughter's memory by starting an organization called the Love is Greater Than Hate Project. It's a nonprofit, and our dual mission is to end violence against our girls and women and to have all people inspired, educated, and motivated to choose love over hate. It's how Jesse would have wanted it, he says, what she lived for and what she wrote about in the music that lives on after her death. But that's just me with this I feel free. Don't get me wrong, I'll never be okay with what Dan did to Jesse. But Jesse's life and death for me are, are for bringing light into this world. My life's getting better and better all the time. Love is greater than hate. And when you die.